All right, back at it with part two at looking at stable diffusion. I'm still in the stable build of the HLKY fork for this one. In this video, I'll be looking at image to image transformations, masking, and masking a specific area to attempt a face swap. I'll also try to show how some parameters affect the image output so you can dial into your desired creation a little quicker. When you first open the image to image tab, a placeholder image is in the editor if you want to try it out right away. Clear it away with the X to load another image. If you're using the crop tool, crop and resize images that are smaller than 512 by 512 pixels for best results. Also try to make sure that the crop window isn't outside the bounds of the image. If you have trouble with the crop or mask tools, check the show hints button under the prompt entry box. If the mask tool isn't correctly positioned with your mouse pointer, Try holding down your control key on your keyboard and using the mouse wheel to zoom in and out of the browser window a little bit. I find this generally fixes the focus and resets it without needing to refresh the window and lose any work. I'm going to take one of the less successful images from the first video and try to turn it into something a little closer to the prompt. Young Lucille Ball wearing a cocktail dress holding a flamingo. The web UI has a built-in image editor which has all the basic tools needed to manipulate something for the image to image transformations. An eraser, a brush, a color picker, and a paint bucket. Matching colors and doing the world's crudest attempt at cell shading can help guide the model into positioning things the way you want them. Unfortunately for me, the advanced editor tends to freeze, so I'll do the rest of this in good old MS Paint. I'll take the image and just fix it up a little so she only has two legs. I'll pick a vaguely matching skin tone and a vaguely matching background color to help guide the output. A masterpiece. Let's say I like the image conceptually but didn't really like the details. For that, you can try feeding the image back into the model using the same phrase and see how it's reinvented. It's been fairly well noted that stable diffusion generally has difficulty with hands. You might find that if a subject is supposed to be holding something, specifying in their hand or appending another phrase involving hands will guide the model into producing better looking hands. Raising the CFG slider will increase adherence to the prompt, but going too far produces, uh, let's just call them deviants. Let me lower that a little more and try one more time. All right, I think that looks pretty good. It adheres to the prompt better and looks like a youngish Lucille Ball and Jeeps holding a flamingo. Although its head is the wrong way around, but I think we can work with that. I want to save that new image and work on it further. So I'll click the copy selected image button and bring it over to the input window. If you're trying to generate a person, appending the word model to the end of your phrase may give you more interesting output. You might find that your generated person is in different poses depending on the step count setting. But you may need to raise or lower the CFG slider a step to keep your output making sense. Too high of a CFG value and the model will attempt to amalgamate every idea into one single thing, producing some very interesting images. So I'd like to attempt to have the stable diffusion model rework this picture. So I'm going to append the word model with a low weight, and that should bring in some concepts of beauty, perfect skin, good hand position, and good lighting. As you can see, the image is somewhat similar, but the output as a whole resembles professional modeling photos more than before. The subject is often holding the object in question in a way to emphasize it, and the lighting and composition is what you think of in a product modeling sense. He all raised the CFG slider to an extreme, causing the output to adhere more to the prompt and amalgamate all the ideas into, uh, well, horrifying flamingo arms. Bring it back down for approaching reality again, with only three humanoid arms. The denoise slider is a funny one. It seems to practically function like a crossfitter or an AB slider when blending the two images, but seems to have two sections or domains. 0 to 0.49 seems to behave differently than 0.5 to 1, but it's tough to explain. I think you'll notice it after fiddling around with the software long enough though. You can see there's some interplay between the CFG level and the denoise level. 
and you'll need to balance both if you're getting nonsensical output. Adding the term model with a low weight to the prompt, and keeping a low denoise level, subtly blends the two images together. In addition to making the person look better, the flamingo's head has been correctly rotated around. Going to extremes on the denoise slider can generate some interesting results. To keep things in the realm of reality, you might need to adjust the CFG slider as well. Now here's some weirdness. Here it appears to have interpreted things extremely literally, turning everything into plastic models. Dialing it back a little and we get human looking model photos again. And now here's our final image produced by Stable Diffusion. Now let's try some masking. I'll do some basic in-painting and out-painting here to try to demo how it works. To use the mask tool, select the mask radio button and load the image into the editor the same way as before. If you find the mask tool isn't properly following your mouse pointer, scroll wheel zoom in and out of the page a little and it should reposition correctly. Try to fill in as much of the mask area as you can. I'm not sure how the back end is communicating the mask area to the model. Small gaps in the mask don't seem to make any difference, but this may be related to the blurring setting. This method of outpainting is crude, but it works in a pinch, and you may get lucky with a well-positioned background, but Stable Diffusion isn't aware of what's going on inside the mask. Inpainting works a lot better. Here I'll perform a face-off. Masking the area and simply trying to prompt a face can work, but specifying the style of a Hollywood headshot could bring better front-facing photos. There isn't really a trick to inpainting, and the same principles seem to apply when it comes to adjusting the parameters. If you produce an image that is almost but not quite your desired output, you can try feeding that image back into the transformer by hitting the Send Image to Input button. Sometimes all it takes is another round to clean things up. I've twiddled some knobs and sent the image back through the model a couple times, and I think the results are pretty good. Now that I've generated some small images, I'll show you how they can be upscaled and face corrected with the Python version of Real ESR GAN. There is a standalone executable for Windows, but it won't work for those with 1600 series cards. It also lacks the feed forward support for GFP GAN, so it really only does half the job. If you're going to be stuck using the standalone version, I'd stick to the Python scripts for their extra features. Since I'm limited by GPU memory, I don't load the real ESR GAN or GFP GAN models with the web UI, but the standalone script is really easy to use once it's installed. Check the description down below for the real ESR GAN command line and a link to the models. The standalone Python version of real ESR GAN has integrated GFP GAN support, but lacks a pretty GUI. However, there are GUI implementations of real ESR GAN by other developers, and I'll link to a couple down below, but I haven't used them personally and I'm not sure if they have built-in GFP GAN integration. To install real ESR GAN, first create a new separate Conda environment from all your others with Conda, create, dash n, and then the name of your new environment. Activate your new Conda environment by typing Conda, activate, and then the name of your new environment. Once it's loaded, check your Python version by typing Python, and then two dashes, and version. If you're on the 3.10 branch, you're going to need to downgrade Python. Do that by typing conda install python equals 3.8. Next, install git to conda by typing conda install git. Once that's done, we're going to install PyTorch for conda and all its dependencies. So to do that, type conda install pytorch torch vision torch audio cuda toolkit equals 11.3 dash c pytorch next clone the repo for the realsrgan project by typing git clone 
the URL to the repo, and then the directory you'd like it placed in, if different than the project name, which is real-esrgan. After the repo is cloned, change the directory by typing cd, and then whatever directory you've placed the repo in. Install some Python dependencies by typing pip install basic sr face xlib and gfpgan. Next, install the requirements for the project itself by typing pip install dash r requirements.txt. And finally, install the project by typing python setup.py develop. Place the downloaded models in the experiments slash pre-trained underscore models folder. The face enhancement model for GFPGAN will be downloaded upon first run. The script will process all of the images in the specified input directory with whichever model you select and use face correction with GFPGAN if the command line flag is used. Here's a few images upscaled using the real ESRGAN X4 Plus model, first using face correction enabled and then without. I'm going to cut it here and start looking toward part 3, but I may get distracted looking at pictures that are, for copyright reasons, not what a Super Saiyan Xenomorph would look like. If you found this helpful, please hit subscribe or leave a comment. YouTube won't let this channel get any bigger without engagement, and it's hard to get engagement without being a drama channel these days. That said, my health has improved a little in the past few weeks, and I should be able to respond to comments a bit faster going forward. If there's anything you want me to cover in the future, leave a comment or poke around and find my email address. I think it's still on the About section. Back soon with part three, and thanks for watching.